All right. Well, sorry, guys. We are about six minutes late. Uh, if you guys have been watching any of my um, interviews in the past, uh, all right. Well, I've been saying this every time. Seriously, Satan hates me. Every time I start a uh, interview, we hop on about, let's say, 15 minutes before and a new problem comes up. It's always an audio delay problem or... Today, uh, my guest sounded like he was uh, inside the Roman Colosseum. And so uh, we're trying to fix that. But uh, if you guys are here with us, thanks for being here. Hey, anyone who is on the YouTube chat, uh, please hit that live chat button. We can see your uh, questions and we could do some live Q&A if we have some time. But uh, I wanted to uh, just kind of introduce uh, our, our guest for today. I'm very thankful that uh, he's here. And um, I'm just really happy that uh, we're able uh, to do this. Uh, my guest today is uh, Pastor Wilson Wang. And uh, let me get him here on the screen. Oh, here, there we go. Pastor Wilson, everyone can see you. All right. Um, it, it, this is really fun because uh, Pastor Wilson and I, we actually went to Talbot Seminary together, the greatest seminary in California. <laughs> Um, but what's really funny is that uh, I knew who he was, and I actually, I think I had a class with him. I don't quite remember, but I do remember him because we used to pass each other in the hallways. But we actually didn't really connect and um, get to know each other until this thing called 30 Network, where uh, my friends and I, DJ Kevin, Sam, and Angela, we did this thing called 30 Network Retreat. Uh, pastors in their 30s, meeting for 30 hours and uh, network together and that was how that was like three years ago and uh, you were actually one of the featured speakers and uh, that's where i actually first started to connect with you and so uh that was really fun uh pastor wilson wing is uh, a church planter planted a church in fulton california called renew church and um I, I resonate with that a lot because i was formerly a church planter in the city of brea and uh, wilson you don't know this but then i was actually I don't know if you remember. It's actually, we did we did meet, but you were meeting so many people because you were a celebrity signing autographs. But uh, I actually went to your preview service. No at way. The, I think it's called Mer Meridian up. at the gym. Yeah. Yeah. So I was actually there, and uh, my wife and I went because we were actually church planting during that time. Wow. And I remember you had a preview service, and uh, man, that place was packed. It's like 300 people. And um, I never uh, saw that number again. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, hey, I feel you, man. I feel you, okay? That's a forever church planter. Um, but that that was really fun, just seeing you there. Uh, and so thank you so much for being here. And um, I, I'm just, again, I'm thankful for just us getting to know each other and um, connecting at 30 Network. Uh, a fellow volleyball player, by the way. Uh, Wilson, you got to please uh, give me some volleyball uh, tutorials. I, I could never match my timing with the hit. I was always off with my timing. And so you need to throw me some uh, sets and I need to hit for you and you could uh, coach me there for a little bit. But um, hey, uh, why don't you just take a time just to introduce yourself beyond what I just said. Uh, for those who are watching who don't know you, uh, maybe share a little bit about your family, uh, some of your background, your ministry, things like that. So go ahead. Yeah, thanks, John. Really good that we could finally do this. We've talked about it a few times. Um, I think mostly I just love being a church planter. I love pioneering things and starting from scratch. I think being able to envision something and then have it become tangible has been such an, a beautiful process for me. So uh, I started Epic at Cal State Fullerton with, uh, with crew and um, got, to do, got to do really amazing ministry there. Did apartment life for a while. And there were just kind of two spaces that became mission fields, whether it's reaching college campuses or people in the apartment complex. And then I felt like out of those mission fields of, of three years and two years, God had us plant renew. And it's just been an amazing adventure. I, I love my community. They're so special to me. Um, and it really was kind of this childhood dream. I remember in fifth grade, when other kids are daydreaming about being an astronaut or police officer, I thought one day I wanted to plant a church with a sign that said, for imperfect people only outside the door. And so 
I get to walk into that on Sundays and um, just the fulfillment of that early childhood uh, dream was amazing. Besides that, I've married this Korean Australian, sassy, smart um, gal and she's, we've been married for 10 years. We have a little one, four months old. He looks like the Michelin man, but, but baby form and Asian. And then we have another kid who just turned uh, three and he's a lot of fun too. So two boys, still shooting for a girl. Um, yeah, and then I love beach volleyball. So that's pretty much the only other thing I do. I love going to the beach. I miss it so much. I'm sure all of us have things we miss a lot because uh, of the lockdown, but yeah, right when that ends, I'm gonna run to the beach and play some volleyball. And, and please, uh, when you get to do that, if I could just be uh, there, give, give me like 15 minutes, man. Just please help me with my timing. You play beach or all indoor? You know what? Beach, I'm not that good because uh, I, it's just hard to jump in the sand for me. I, I'm already short. I'm 5'6", so it's really hard for me to get up. But um, hey, man, uh, I, I, as, a, as a coach of mine, I'll go wherever you tell me to go. All right? I'll go wherever you tell me to go. <laughs> all right. There. We'll train. You'll feel like a superhero indoors if you play on the beach a little bit. I would love that. I would love that. Um, Pastor Wilson, uh, as, as a church planter and um, been doing that for a couple of years, married with kids, uh, you know, this, this COVID-19 came out of uh, kind of nowhere for all of us. And um, hey, DJ, just to let you guys know, DJ says, hi, Wilson. That was the name of uh, Tom Hanks' volleyball. <laughs> That's what DJ just said on the YouTube live chat. Thanks, DJ. Thanks for watching. But um, so COVID-19 kind of came out of nowhere. How, how are you kind of personally doing how is your family doing are you guys okay and how are your how is your wife and kids kind of responding to all of this yeah thanks for asking i mean my kids are pretty much oblivious except that they don't get to go on play dates uh the big one's a little bummed about that my wife is probably having her best life because she has us home all the time and I just remember like all these years, over 10 years of marriage, just asking her every year, are you happy? Are you happy with our life? You know, our church plants off the ground. You're an OT now. We bought a house. And I never got just that immediate yes. And now she's just like, I'm happy. I love having dinner every night. I love being able to play in the neighborhood. I love having you home. And so I think it it kind of woke me up a little bit to like what really is meaningful to her that we kind of have different things that uh, maybe we're running after. And so that's been humbling and good and just embracing the slowness a little bit. I kind of came to a grinding halt um, when everything locked down, I was running full speed. So that was a tough adjustment, but just enjoying baby, enjoying the little guy enjoy my life, my wife, and just really thankful that um, a lot of our needs are provided for. And um, yeah, I think the most frustrating parts of it's over because I think like three weeks ago, every other day there was a change. Every other day I was scrapping my plans for the church or small group or Sunday. And then I, I feel like we have some new normal now this last week. And so kind of um, sinking into that at this point. Yeah. You know, um... I've been following kind of your church plan as you're posting on Facebook, things like that. And um, I remember recently you guys actually um, got into El Dorado High School. And I, I remember seeing that post and you guys had this video. And bro, I was so happy for you guys. I was like, dude, that's awesome. You know, a couple of years back, I was helping uh, our church, Saddleback, um, trying to find a new spot in Brea. And um El Dorado High School was one of the spots that we were looking at. And there was another church there at that time. But uh, I know that church recently left. And then El Dorado just recently remodeled. And so there was a bunch of high schools that I had uh, mapped out from my church planning days. I had all that info. Don't take it from me, John. Don't take it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no way. No way. That'll never happen. Back. No, no way. Never happened, dude. Uh, they're already in your Belinda, so it's okay. You don't have to worry about them. But I was so happy, man. I was so happy for you guys because I knew that it was a great spot. They just remodeled. And I was so happy for your church. In light of everything that just happened, because now we're in lockdown. We, we can't be in physical gatherings anymore. How did that affect your church? Did it like kind of 
slowed down the momentum? Were people really discouraged? How was your congregation uh, kind of responding to that? Because that's like a huge thing for a church plant to get into like a, a new building. What happened there? Yeah, it was tough. I think, um, I think the way COVID-19 hit for me and for our community, we were just kind of ramping up. You know, we had a lot of momentum going into this, this last season. And it just came to a grinding halt, man. I don't know what else to say. So I think for us, there was just, we were, I was going full speed. Our team was going full speed. And then it was just like a wall appeared out of nowhere and just stopped us in our tracks. And I felt like it took a while to uh, grieve some of those losses and to refocus on, okay, here are the limits that God's placed in front of me, in front of our community. And how are those limits going to guide us um, as we believe in his providence and his, his sovereignty? It's obviously not to speed up. It's obviously not to go faster. Uh, but one, of, one little word that the Lord gifted me, especially that first week when I was frustrated, is that, you know, what he's given to me, no one can take away. And so I, I believe that if God has El Dorado for our community, that it's still going to be there, you know, um, I don't need to have a death grip on it. And so I'm just trusting the Lord with it. I think all of us had to sur have to surrender so many aspects of our life, right, over the last uh, couple of weeks to the Lord and, and to believe that his hands are the most secure. So I felt like our church did that well. We were disappointed, but, but there's been some really cool things, too, um, over the last two weeks. All right. Um... I'd, uh, there's been just this terrible rise of uh, race, racism against Asians. A lot of people blaming Asians, a lot of people blaming Chinese people because of where this virus uh, originated from. Um, of course, calling it the Chinese virus doesn't help and things like that. Um, I remember back in 9-11 when we were in college, the same exact thing happened. I remember reading about these foolish and just violent attacks against ethnic Muslims or anyone who even looked Middle Eastern or Persian or just like from Turkey. Um, it was just so, so frustrating seeing that. Now it's happening to us um, and it's, it's still frustrating. It's terrible. Um, how, what do you think about that? How, what are you thinking when you read about these things? And if you could provide some wisdom here as an Asian American, as a Korean American, as a Christian, it makes me so angry. Yeah. And um, unfortunately, a lot of um, the Christian Asians are writing about their angry thoughts, which they have the freedom to do, but it isn't just, it isn't helping anything. It just kind of adds more fuel to the fire. So what is, what is some wisdom? How can Asian Christians especially respond to this uh, as a whole? Yeah, to be honest, John, I'm still, um, I'm still processing it. I think for me, I've been talking to different people about racial reconciliation for the last six months. And the way I describe it, people at the church who, this is a core part of their heart. Um, we want to be a multicultural church. In some ways we are, but I don't want to do that just from like the website or the stage. I want hard conversations to happen and us to reconcile and and support each other, adopt each other's stories. And so the way I described it to my friends, one's Latino, one's uh, majority culture, is that they're very well versed in this. I, I tell them that I feel like Asians are like the awkward kid on the outside of the conversation. So everyone else is like talking, angry or, or thoughtful, and we're just kind of observing. And maybe there's this part of me that just hates confrontation. I don't really want to be invited in looking in from the outside is kind of okay. And then all of a sudden COVID-19 has really brought us in the middle of a, of a conversation that a lot of us haven't engaged in um, it, it, for the majority of our lives. And, and we've become a little bit more educated over the last couple of years, but not really sure how we fit. And I think there's a blessing in learning to start exercising our voice, you know, and, and then asking other people to adopt our story and to care for, for this racism that's going on. I think that as we do this well for ourselves, we'll learn how to do it for others. Um, that 
when our brother, when our black brother and sisters need us to um, share in their pain or to advocate for them or our Latino brothers and sisters were able to do that well. So I'm still kind of formulating some thoughts on how I would respond, you know? I feel like we, we might be putting ourselves in that scenario, right? Like we're at the grocery store and someone throws out like an angry, angry slur or says like, you know, why'd you bring that virus to the US? I don't think any of the one-liners I have <laughs> is like gospel centered yet, but I, I think some of it's just trying to educate people on statistics or like, you know, how much of their ethnic, you know, evils are they owning? And, but I, I feel like I don't have a really complete answer in the moment. I think some of what I've thought about is how to respond online, you know, where maybe I could be more thoughtful. Um, yeah. And how to even just own the hurt of my Asian brother sisters as my own. I feel like when this first came up, it was hard to even look at. It was hard to say that this is an offense to me and my ethnicity. And then to start saying the gospel, it's so anti-gospel to be racist because the gospel is about this multicultural family that God's bringing together. And, and to say that when we stand against racism, we're standing for the gospel. So I'm thinking through it. I'm trying to navigate my church through it, but I'm a learner. I would say I'm definitely a learner. Pastor John, have you put yourself in that scenario? Like this angry person at Target's yelling at you, blaming you for the COVID-19. What are you gonna say? Uh, you know, uh, you don't wanna know my answer. <laughs> It's She's not a good die. answer. It's not a good answer, man. Um, <laughs> it's just, man, it makes me so angry. Yeah, I just get so, um, I get so livid when we see ignorance and foolishness being played out. Um, I, I mean, I even get angry about all the hoarding that's going on right now. It's just, right. it makes no sense to me. And, I, and I've been saying this every day on my um, 12 p.m., uh, live show that I, we got to work together here this selfish kind of buying out like 50 gallons of milk is just insane and i i feel so fortunate because there have been people friends of mine even some church members who have been like driving to my apartment from irvine because they knew that like i needed children's medicine for my kids and we couldn't find any it's just that kind of a kindness and love that I think is so necessary and so encouraging. But um, I mean, this is why I'm asking that question. It's just like, it's so hard to um, respond to this uh, in a loving way, in a loving way. I mean, yeah. basically it starts with patience and to hold your tongue, of course, but um, it's just crazy, man. It's insane. Yeah, I think, well, fear just makes people dumb, you know, just across the board. But I also feel that there is an aspect of anger that's helpful because anger is protective and it protects things that are precious to us. And, I, and when I think about my ethnicity, it should be something that I want to protect that is, that is precious. But it's how do we express this anger in a way that, you know, is constructive, isn't violent. So it's, it's hard though, because again, as an Asian American guy, like I don't have very many positive examples of anger except for like, you either go Kung Fu on someone, right? That's all I see from the movies or Asian dad. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's no scalable anger. There's no like one through one to five angry and then like nine, 10, 11. All I see is 10 plus or zero or like the swallowing of anger. You know, you either swallow it and eat it and have it just kind of sit in your soul for the rest of your life or you just go ape crap on people. There's nothing in between right how do i how do i say i'm angry um and express that and, and protect what's valuable to me in a way that also educates and still gives the other person their dignity you know i'm not i'm not destroying their dignity because they're destroying mine but I know, have you heard of uh have you heard of the asian american christian collaborative yet yeah yeah so we're looking at the, the statement there which i yeah. thought really well well written mm -hmm. yeah and so uh yeah i signed it and you know a lot of our mutual friends are the people dj is actually one of the people part of that team 
And so um, I think something like that is really great. I hope more people, more churches sign it, not just for us to sign to um, support one another, but I think it helps spread awareness that we can say churches like this church, that church, or this person, and, and help spread more awareness because God, it's not just Asians, but a lot of non-Asians are signing this. And and why shouldn't they? You know, it's all about we don't want uh, racism to exist against Asian Americans or Asians. And so, um, yeah, I hope you guys continue to uh, read that, share that, and, and maybe uh, come to come to signing that. That that would be great. Um, mm-hmm. You know, again, that's just one example of what's going on. There's a lot of other bad stuff happening. Um, people are losing their jobs. Um, people are on the brink of losing their businesses. Perhaps there's people at your church who who are sick or have family members who are sick. I just learned today, actually, um, a close friend of mine, there, what her, what his wife just told my wife and I that he he has it. So, um, so so crazy. That this is actually the first personal kind of what is that like separation by one that i've had to the virus Um, i I don't know anyone else who has it personally um what are some key things that renew church right now is focusing on like you and your staff or whoever it is these past two weeks what's like the vision you're casting and what is are you and your team doing right now you guys are saying like yuck guys here are some things that we got to start doing now. Uh, share some of those things. Yeah, I think for us, I mean, we have a lot of young adults. That's a lot of our demographic and probably like 20 or 30 families. Um, so we're a pretty young church. And I tell my church that we've been training for this moment from 2020 January because we've been, we went through Emotionally Healthy Discipleship by Pete Scazzaro. And so much of the focal point has been silence and solitude, but we live super noisy lives, right? Ronnie Chan talks about how like you're watching TV on the wall and you have like four other screens between you and the television, like your iPad, your phone, your, your laptop. And um, I just think about this quarantine being for our community, uh, not for everyone, but for our community, I think there's an aspect of it where it's a gift from the Lord in him bringing us to a place of silence and solitude and us going deep into this, um, this quietness in our soul and, and hearing from him and, and being face to face with him. So every day we do like a daily devotional where we sit in silence, uh, where we listen to scripture, listen to his voice. And then I I just have seen our church care for each other really well, whether it's bring supplies over to each other's homes, you know, toilet paper, zinc, um, or just um, coming together more often. So actually we've seen all of our small groups grow, um, except for our youth group, because I think people are just longing for a community. They want to connect. And we're in our demographic, a lot of young adults, some of them are just displaced from their family and they're in an apartment by themselves right when we think of quarantine it's kind of noisier in some ways because we have our kids around all the time but I can't imagine spending 24 hours alone and then doing that you know every single day and so for us that's kind of been our focus how do we love each other and and connect with each other we do bible studies we just did like a fitness thing this afternoon board games uh And in our community, how are we reaching out to other people who feel alone and isolated? And then on the other side of that, how are we really stewarding this very different season, this season with so many limits to listen to God and be one-on-one with him and and allow us ourselves to go deeply into silence and solitude. There's almost like a monastic opportunity here, I think, for a lot of us that we might never have again. And so for our church, that's kind of been our focus. Um, It's funny because we've done so much outreach over the last year and a half, you know, whether it's with foster kids or um, people who have gone through domestic violence or mentoring at-risk youth. But all of that was shut down over the last couple of weeks. We're not, we can't go to any of those programs. We can't run them anymore. So I think God's just really, at least for Renew, turned us inward and allowed us to go deeper in, in our relationship with him. And it's been amazing to see our church embrace that, a lot of them. 
what's the kind of the age demographic of your church? Do you have a lot of millennials, Jay, millennial parent, or is it more like Gen Z? Yeah, it's primarily millennial. So okay. probably the bulk of us are probably in our 20s to early 30s. And then we have a growing like family uh, group of young married without kids and married with kids, probably like 30, 30 married couples. Okay, okay. Uh, let's pretend that <clears throat> there's like millions of people watching you. You are on the pulpit. You are, uh, for somehow, some reason, you are able just to preach one message, one, one word of encouragement or hope or something. You're able just to preach a message, one, one idea to millions of people, and they're all tuning in. Uh, what would be your message? What would be your message of hope or encouragement? Or what what would you preach right now to everyone? Man, that's a lot of pressure. <laughs> <laughs> would, it be, would it be different than uh, what I had prepped? I don't know. I'm thinking, thinking of that. <laughs> Come on, man. You could do it. You're, you're Talbot, man. You're a theologian. No, I, I wanted to share, if it's okay, I wanted to share my, uh, me and my wife wrote a children's book. And yeah, I think, talk, let's talk about that after more though. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. <laughs> I think it pertains a lot to COVID-19. Okay. Uh, but um, I think when I look at COVID-19 and when I think about, you know, this, this disease that has us thinking about death often and questioning, like, why would God make a world that has viruses and, and allows people to have their lives cut short? I just think about this amazing redemptive story. So, um, you know, me and my wife, we, we started just wanting to communicate to kids um, this big story. And, and I think when we think about like Asian American theology, I feel like this is our gift to the broader church is to have a greater um, concept or um, understanding of this narrative gospel, right? Kind of like from Eden all the way to Revelation. And so we thought about like, man, what would Eden look like in terms of our physical bodies? Like if we were invincible, what would we do with Jesus? So we talked about, you know, surfing on tornadoes and bear hugging bears and sleeping in the snow. And then how in our, in our sin, we were separated from him. And that's when our bodies became vulnerable. That's when death entered the world. We looked at all these Jewish laws that have to do with, you know, what we're trying to do now, keeping our hands clean, isolation, social distancing, when we have a contagious disease. And then we, we think about Jesus as a great healer. Like one of his greatest functions on earth was to take away disease, right? He heals Peter's mom. He touches the leopard. He heals the woman who's bleeding. And then, and then I think what he does with the church is he invites us into his healing work and a lot of our occupations when it comes to um, like an optometrist mirror Jesus' ministry. So Jesus heals the blind. And if I become an optometrist, I'm like extending his ministry of vision. Or Jesus heals Peter's mom of, of fever. If I become a doctor or a pharmacist, I'm extending Jesus' ministry uh, by relieving people of a virus. And so I just, I think we've leaned really heavily on our medical professionals on our pharmacists, and, and they can become gods during this time. But what if we saw and encouraged um, our doctors and nurses and pharmacists to see that, man, there's this great physician that they're extending the work of in all these different categories. And I think the great hope is that when Jesus dies on the cross, right, he, man, he promises us eternal life. And there's this sense that there's this promise that Jesus will come back and all the ways in which our medicine and our, and, our, um, and our healing have limits where people still die or, you know, a virus still comes back or someone just dies of old age. In the new kingdom, he heals us to completion. He makes our bodies unbreakable. He gives us eternal life. He gives, you know, we can maybe give comfort to someone through psychology, but God gives the world unending peace. And so for me, I think I remember where we are um, in the fear, in the panic, in the anxiety, but I tried to 
uh, take a step back and just say, man, we're a part of a bigger story where Jesus wins and he conquers death and, and viruses. So I think when I look at our context and where we are now, whether it's to a kid or to an adult, I, I share that story with them that Jesus is the great healer. We get to be extensions of that um, in this moment. And then he fulfills and completes this healing work when he comes back. Man, you know, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not just saying this right now, but uh, what you just said right there, dang, that was probably like one of the best answers I've ever heard. Oh, that was just great. Uh, I just really resonated with everything you just said. That was very just uh, powerful for me, just personally. So thank you so much for for sharing that, man. You're 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 a genius, dude. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was great. Um, <clears throat> you know, I I, I never want to end uh, the interview with just uh, bad news about virus stuff like that. But uh, I want to also talk about some cool things and good news. So you know, you talked about it a little bit, but yeah, you're you're an author, dude. You uh, published a children's book. That's cool. And um, Pastor Wilson, I don't know if you know this, but I I used to be a children's pastor for like eight and a half years. And so I have a huge heart for kids, huge heart. Um, when, when I got married, my wife and I uh, were both doing elementary. She used to serve at elementary at her old church while we were dating. And so we loved doing all the VBSs and things like that. And so um, tell me about this story. You know, you shared a little bit about it, but like what made you and your wife say like, hey, we want to write a book? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's been in my heart for a while, just this integration between our occupational calling and this redemptive story, wanting our occupations to be an extension of his ministry, whether it's like the next book we're writing is about justice, so politics, you know, social work, uh, police, law enforcement, and after that, it's going to be creatives. Um, we're going to do teachers, and all of these large occupational fields we want to tie back to Jesus did it first, and we're, we're an extension of his ministry. And, and we, in our occupation, we're redeeming the fall. You know, like, as we extend Jesus' ministry and kingdom, it's actually a, a response to the fall. Like, teaching truth is a response to the lie that we bought into in, in the fall, right? Healing is a response to sickness entering the world because of the fall. Justice through politics, through social work and law enforcement as a response to the violence we've done to each other because of the fall. And, and so I really want kids to, and adults really, it's encouraged a lot of adults to see it as truly a calling in which they're doing ministry, you know, every day, nine to five. And, and, and when we do that correctly and we make it to the new earth, we'll see that the work we put into is completed by the Lord and has eternal value. So that's that's basically um, our book series. We got a, a really amazing grant from L2. So we're running 2,000 uh, copies of the first two books. And our Kickstarter's uh, uh, finishing off this week on Thursday. I pressed launch on my Kickstarter, and then four hours later, the MBA shut down. I was like, well, that's done. <laughs> oh, man. So we're not going to be able to, you know, we're probably going to be funding most of it, but but I just really believe in these stories, these books. Uh, the illustration is amazing. Uh, we built a small team from our church. And all the proceeds go to foster kids. So every book bought on Kickstarter, we're going to give a book away to uh, foster kids. I mentor two of them. I go to a camp every year that's like four days long with foster kids. And um, I just really want to see that ministry um, extend out where they know that they're because they just wrestle with purpose a lot, you know, foster kids. They wrestle with worth and value, whether they have, um, yeah, whether they're like just kind of trash being thrown from one house to another, or whether they have a God-given and created purpose. And I think that's my message to those kids that, man, God had such great purpose uh, for you in, in your birth, and, and he's going to give you an amazing call that only you can do. And I hope that these books bring that to the kids um, when I can't. So yeah, I really believe in it. Um, lastly, we have the digital version with the worksheet that we're just giving away for free. I know a lot of parents are 
are doing homeschooling. And so this could be a great way to integrate uh, kind of the story I just told into your homeschool curriculum and um, help your kids understand like how God fits into this whole COVID-19 thing, you know? So I'm really excited about it. Thanks for letting me, you know, promote it. And uh, I just think the timing is kind of surreal. Uh, us writing it, having a bunch of books and kind of all, all of this happening, so. Uh, so where, um, I, I have Renew Church in the link already in the YouTube description, but after we cut this all off, I'll, I'll add these links in. But if people wanted to support your book, um, is there another place that they could go to to support it? Yeah, right now, Kickstarter's uh, the, best, the best thing to do. Okay. And we also have our Facebook fan page. Okay. Uh, yeah, it gives all these constant updates. Like when we get that large shipment, you know, everything's kind of posted there. Yeah, we kind of treat our fan page as our extended team. To, okay, that's, uh, that's awesome. Okay, so after we end this, um, send me those two links and I'll put that in the description. Um, the Facebook group is, is an open group, right? Anyone could join yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, and dude, that's awesome. I didn't know that all the proceeds were going to support uh, foster kids. I didn't know that. I thought um, this was going to like build your castle or something. <laughs> <laughs> so that's great i love that um let's please you guys go buy this book this is great i i love that so let's i'll put that link down there below too so they can go get it things like that um that's really really awesome uh I, it's just it's so great to see our friends doing stuff like this because again when we were younger I don't, maybe for you, it was a little bit different because uh, I do have some friends in which the parents were a little bit more Americanized, but traditionally, most of us, we weren't really encouraged to write books or go be an actor or be a, a backup dancer. You know, that's what I wanted to be. I wanted to be a professional backup dancer. And so I love seeing uh, you writing and publishing, and, and that's just great. And I hope more of us um, have the courage to do it or uh, more of us just kind of step out of faith and just kind of go for it. And so I'm so happy for you, so happy for your wife. I love that. I, dude, I didn't know you guys were writing more. That's great, more books. So that, that's pretty cool. Um, so hey, we're gonna sign off here, but don't go anywhere, okay? You and I, we're gonna stay on the Zoom call, but I'm gonna sign off here on the, on the stream. And uh, I apologize, you guys, while we were streaming, there's been a lot of dropped frames, and so it's a little bit jittery. But uh, all the audio was coming out clearly, so the content is key here. But I want to thank Pastor Wilson. Thank you so much. And uh, for the rest of you guys, let's stay connected. Uh, I am uh, doing these kind of uh, live interviews, hopefully like on a weekly basis. And um, I want us to just uh, work together. We got to defeat this thing together. And um, these are just some... Some, some very important topics, not just interesting topics, but important talks to talk about. And so um, thanks to you guys for tuning in. DJ, if you're still watching, thanks for watching. And uh, I hope you guys can check out the links below. There's a link for the Asian American Christian Collaborative. Check out that statement of faith. You guys got to sign that. Uh, read it. Hopefully your church signs it. And then I have two link, more links, actually three more links, a link to Renew Church. Anyone around Fullerton, California, please check out Renew Church. Uh, Pastor Wilson Wang, I trust this guy, great guy, and um, these guys are, are a great church. Please check out their church online, and uh, I'm sure they would love to meet you and get you connected. And then there's the Facebook group page to the uh, kind of this book kind of support group for uh, Pastor Wilson Wayne and his wife. And then, of course, the link to actually purchase the book or to support the book on Kickstarter. Check it out, guys. All the proceeds go to foster kids. And um, I hope you guys can support. Thanks for watching, everyone. And I will see you guys next week. And uh, I hope you guys stay safe and stay healthy.